What's going on, everybody? Happy Wild Card Week. Welcome into an all-new episode of the Packaday Podcast. I'm your host, Andy Herman. You can follow me on Twitter at Andy Herman NFL. You know my guest, the one and only Mike Wall. You can find him on Twitter or X at Mike Wall68. Mike, it is, it's not even Wild Card Week. It is Super Wild Card Week, another one of those amazing NFL rebrands. Uh, how the heck have you been? And uh how's your uh, wild card week treating you? I've been great, Andy. Thanks for having me on. As always, uh, it's gonna be, you know, the super wild card stuff. I just you know without we'll get into a rant but when, when do we want to talk about the peacock thing because i can't get over it like Go i just it. i cannot get over the nfl has done so well that they now are trying to branch out and i you know somebody did the math i think it was mad dog russo did the math he's like every owner is going to get 3.2 million or something like that for this for this peacock game so you're going to make all these chiefs fans my nfl fans Subscribe to something that they would never subscribe to otherwise and or go through the process. Some poor old guy in Missouri can't figure out even how to use his phone. You know what I mean? And to make three and a half million bucks, which is a lot of money to you and me, but it ain't anything to those guys. That's like me buying you like supersized fries at McDonald's. So <laughs> I just think like the greed is I will never stop loving this game. We talked about it last time. The greed that they are go like the process that they're going through to just grab more money, more eyeballs at the expense of the game, at the expense of 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 some of the fan base. I just it sucks, man. It really sucks. It does. They're I'm not like... gonna watch that game. I'm just telling you right now. Like I as I would love to watch that game unless I'm not watching that game. And I bet you my wife has has Peacock, so I'm probably lying. But I'm not I'm not signing up for Peacock to watch that game. It just infuriates me. Uh, thankfully, in our household, uh, we, I think, have every streaming service known to man, um, unfortunately. So it'll be on, I'm sure. But I totally get it. And it's it's just one of those things. I'm sure next year it's going to be Peacock and Amazon is mm -hmm. probably what it's going to be next. And just going to go. And it's, it's so funny because I think forever, and this is, again, a totally different tangent, but when everyone had cable, they're like, oh, I wish I could just pick my own channels and decide what I want to sign up for. And then now everyone has their own damn streaming service and everything. And it's just like, I wish everything was just bundled in one spot. I could just have one thing yeah. and not have to worry about it. And now it's like, it's all over the place. Now we've got cable, like seven streaming services. It's it's a nightmare. Here's the thing that drives me. Here's what I can't get over because I'm, I'm a typical American. If it's a commercial, I'm going to watch something else, right? Yeah. I'm not going to sit there and just wait for the next thing to go, especially on Amazon Prime. <laughs> you have to listen to the same Fitz Magic commercial for a hundred times this season. I, I'm going to throw up if I see that, that that damn commercial again. And you can't change the channel. I yeah. mean, you can't change the channel, Andy. It's the most frustrating. It goes against everything I believe in. I'm at the Super Bowl after the first two channel th or uh, commercial deals. I know because they're big, you know, commercial, commercial. I'm changing the channel there. Like I won't watch anything else. I just don't. I can't do it. I need constant action. I'm with you. Uh, thankfully, even if uh, people aren't going to watch Dolphins Chiefs, which should be a good game, it is a, a good slate of uh, wild card games this weekend. I think I'm excited for just about all of them. Philly, yeah. Tampa on the forefront fe feels like the weakest of the group, but even that, like Philly's been playing so poorly that that a lot feels of narratives like narratives there. Yeah, yeah, a lot of narratives feels like it go in different a variety of different directions. So yeah, I'm I'm excited about everything. Uh, but let's kick things off, of course, with Packers Bears uh, this past week. Packers pick up the big win to get into Super Wild Card Weekend. Your uh, overall takeaways from that game? Well, just a great win against a division rival that honestly, for uh, through a number of narratives, had a lot to play for. You certainly didn't know what um, what Justin Fields' future. And I guess we still don't officially know what his future holds. Um, obviously, they just got rid of their their offensive staff. So there's some there's some interesting kind of things going on in the background with that, you know, going into that game. But the Packers defense, you just love the bend but don't break. So the bend but don't break style that we um, had maybe admonished Barry for last year, the year before, and everything, I think everything has been kind of on the table with it, with the defense this year. But boy, they 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 played well. And it was another week where the defensive line really just outperformed their opponents. And I think because of that, you start seeing around the red zone, you know, early red zone area, somebody's making a sack, tackle for loss, pushing them back to third and long, and guys are just making plays. You love the physical style that Jair Alexander had in the first play, kind of coming back from that and kind of – we talked about yeah. it on your show, right? If you want to establish that you're part of this team, like that's that's the easiest way to do it, and he sure did a great job of it. And then, gosh, you can't say enough. I was saying this on my show today. I don't know that there's another 
Like, I don't even know who the wide receiver coach is in Green Bay, but he should be a coordinator, right? Yeah, he, he, I mean, you think about if you really want a guy who develops talent, is there a, is there a younger, more developed in a short amount of time group than that in, in the National Football League? Like, there's better wide receiver rooms in the National Football League, I'll grant you that. But given – Given the given the fact that you know all these guys have gotten in and out of the out of, out of the uh, huddle because of injury, think about how well they're playing and just how comp. I mean, the Packers could go into a game versus, in my opinion, any defense in the NFC and feel like they should be able to put points on the board. And I know they didn't yeah. score a ton of points last week, but you see the plays are like they're there. It's just a question of is does, do we call it at the right time and can they get out of a bad one? I mean, that's really the rest of it. The, these guys are playing at a high level. Yeah, I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the defense as well. There's so many narratives and and you know discussion points coming out of this game. Let's start with that defense. Um, I know Ben, but don't break, uh, especially in Packers fandom, has almost got like a like people start regurgitating in their mouth and feeling like they're going to vomit a little bit when they hear it. There's no perfect system in the NFL. There's advantages and disadvantages to everything. And when you run Ben, but don't break the right way, it still has plenty of advantages, and it look can look pretty darn good, like it has these past couple weeks. It feels like a much cleaner process to me over these past two weeks. Weaker opponents, not great offenses overall, though Chicago had had some success coming into this game uh, prior to week 18. Um, but overall, it feels like the communication's been a little bit better. feels like they've been on the same page on the front the, the front of the defense and the back of the defense kind of going hand in hand. We've seen a little bit more blitzing from Quay Walker, Keyshawn Nixon out of the slot in the previous game. Um, it just it feels a little bit more sound than it had earlier in the season. Well, I, I think reps, you know, cure a lot of ailments. And so they're just getting more and more experience and feeling more comfortable with what they're doing. Obviously starting to integrate, which it's, you know, like the, the Quay Walker thing. I mean, how many, we talked about it almost the entirety of the year last year. And it's like, we're finally kind of getting around to it again. Um, when I look at the defense, so let's take this defense and what you see from a play speed standpoint and what you see from a competency standpoint, and maybe template that against like the Detroit Lions who played, our upcoming opponent, the Cowboys, two weeks ago. Sure. They are like they're 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 moving far more. They run a lot more like linebacker dogs and studs, where you're actually mixing it in with the defensive line, slanting and running outside, like like for RPO games and whatnot. Um, yep. They're 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 standing up, you know, like Aiden Hutchinson. Hutchinson, they'll stand him up, and they're doing a great job of identifying when the tight end's supposed to cut off and and kind of following the trapper and whatnot. So they are playing at like a really, really high level that I think when you look at the Green Bay Packers, it's a different style defense, but you need to find those guys, whether it's Ancelotti for the, the linebacker for the, the the Lions, whether it's Hutchinson, like when you start templating onto the Green Bay Packers defense, who are those guys that are continually showing up and making plays? And like Preston's one of those guys for me, for sure. I yeah. think Quay, when he's sending on the blitz, is one of those guys. For, I mean, but you got to find guys who are like, I can hang my hat on that. And then the other part of it is, can they do it just out of base? Like, do we need to manipulate the situation in order for them to be successful? Against the Dallas Cowboys, I know we're talking about the Bears game. The Bears, you can do that because the Bears aren't very good. Right. The Dallas Cowboys, that's a whole different animal, at least up front. Yeah, I think so too. And we'll definitely get into that as we get to that Packers Cowboys breakdown. I want to ask you about a, a handful of players on this Packers defense, or at least a few. Um, Carl Brooks and Devontae Wyatt. Carl Brooks had a really nice game in this one, making uh, disruptive plays, getting into the backfield, big sack to end the game. Devontae Wyatt's an interesting one. He has that quickness, he's got uh, great uh, agility for his size. Doesn't always finish the play uh, from time to time. We've definitely seen that. Uh, but what are you seeing out of those two players along the defensive line? Yeah, so this was this was a great example of if you're 76, I forgot his name. I'm not gonna mention his. I think it's Taven Jenkins. He had a, he yeah, had a bad, yeah. He, yeah, he had a really bad he's not very he had a really bad day. Yeah. And do you see the clip I posted of Quay, or maybe you just saw it in general of Quay shouldering him and him knock, getting knocked down on the ground? Oh yeah, in the in the run game. Yes, yep. yeah, yeah, yeah. I saw it. Yeah, he's so that and that all this stuff like it happens, yep. but it happens a lot to him. And you know, this is one of those games where all your stuff's going to work if you do it with confidence. And I, and what you liked, good players beat bad players. I mean, this is like really, really simple stuff. But if you're a good player, if like you think you're good, then you should beat bad players consistently. And that guy's not playing at a very, a very high level right now. And so you see, and so that just tells me that Carl and Devontae are, are considering themselves good players now. 
Like they're 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 stepping up from a expectation standpoint of where where they think they are. You play you play a dominant game against bad football players in the National Football League if you think you're good, and then you you know you got to fight and claw and scratch against against like kind of the top dogs. But when you are able to have your first, second, third string unit guys come in and kind of dominate a position, you got to feel really good about where they're at. I for me, Carl Brooks is. I said on my show, like, I don't know his numbers. I don't, you know, the, he's the later round draft pick. He's a, he's a football player. Like he's yep. just got this very natural affinity of like finding the football, the way he ran the stunt on the TT game for Kenny. Like there's two ways to run that. You can mesh it. So you're trying to beat the, uh, the guard into the a gap, or you can just, tr- you know, railroad truck the, uh, the, the center. He chose the latter and it worked out really well because the left guard's so porous, but yep. I just love the way that, like, the game comes easy for him despite not being maybe one of your top guys. Like, the game comes very, very easy in the way that he processes information. He's fun to watch. If he gets, you know, continues to develop physically, he could be a guy that's a a starter and a real, real contributor here soon. I totally agree. And he was somebody in college that was so fun to watch. Not the most athletically gifted player in the world. Comes from a smaller school, Bowling Green State. But man, he just consistently found a way to cause chaos in the backfield. They line, I'm sure you know that they, they lined him up at edge. They lined him up as nose tackle, defensive end. Like they lined him up everywhere. And it didn't matter. He just found ways to beat the guy in front of him. The question was, was that going to be able to carry over to an NFL level? It has. And I think if he could just get a little bit, yeah, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say it's like this is the great part about okay, this is the bad part about college football now and the National Football League. But it's also the great part for these young guys, the Christian Watsons of the world, the Tucker Crafts. You can go to a small school and you can be relative. I mean, the coaching is the same the, yeah. the, the, or the lack thereof at a, at a, at a bigger program versus a, a, an FCS versus an FBS. The NFL, we were just talking about it offline. The reason that all these coaches are getting fired, some of them are really, really good generational guys. But we'll talk about them. There's other guys that just aren't very good coaches and they get jobs and they don't know how to develop talent. And so if you get to a place where, you know, if you're a parent out there and your kid gets to a place where they have a coach that cares about them and can teach them the, the fundamentals, and then they have a place to, uh, an opportunity to kind of spread their wings and figure things out like Carl Brooks obviously did, you can show up the NFL and play right away. I mean, it's just, this formula has never been more true than it is right now, just honestly because of the lack of like technical ability and football IQ at the, at the college level that's leading into these younger players. Yeah, it's been fun to watch him develop and, and Devontae as well. Hopefully they can continue to make an impact this upcoming week. I'm going to ask you about another one. Rashawn Gary has been a little bit more quiet as of late. Hasn't had the sack numbers. I think his last sack was against Kansas City. Mm-hmm. Still don't feel like he's playing poorly, but we haven't seen some of those big impact plays that we've come accustomed to seeing out of Rashawn. What have you been seeing out of him as of late? Well, you know, for me, it's I, I first thought, well, okay, is he injured? Because you, just from just from like a – if you're a good player in the league, you should fall into a couple sacks every once in a while. And he's not yeah. right. So then the next thing for me is, and I've said this, I think for two years now, he, he doesn't take advantage of every rush and the way that he thinks about pass rushing is not counterproductive, but um, if, a, if, if a player learns to play with his arms away from the, his body, he's going to have a real hard time beating someone just because just the way he, he thinks about things. There have been plays in games where he's creating pressure and he's the reason that other people get sacked. So we can't like just for sure just say that, you know, he's not being effective, like, you know, to your point. But when you're playing against the, the, the like Darnell Wright's a good player. He's going to be a, a big time player in the National Football yeah, League. Totally. And I think you know, in this week in particular, maybe he just ran up against a guy that's just kind of purpose built to beat to beat a Rashawn Gary. But generally speaking, over the last couple of weeks, you just really want to see him. I don't know if it's starting from a three point stand. I don't know if there's like a way we could get a stance different so he starts. You know, he keeps gets off the ball but a little bit lower, a little bit faster, a little bit better angle. But there's things just from a pass rush standpoint. What I see I, that you could really kind of increase his opportunities for success. Is is he trying to be a speed rusher too much? Like, I, I feel like, yeah. Yeah, I, th- I think so. Well, it's, you know, it's hard because these guys want to be in two points, but you see his two point is different than everybody else's two point. Everybody, like, here's, here's what matters in line play. Uh, here's the big secret. Stance, first step, body position into contact. 
Those are the only three things that matter. We can talk about everything else. Only three things. If your stance doesn't allow you to literally sprint off the line, you can't be a speed rusher. TJ Watt, Miles Garrett, um, the guys that are speed to power, like really, really good guys, they're in stances that allow you to gain leverage on your opponent in your first step. He's really not like that. He's in this low squatty kind of knee bed, double hey, feet are a little bit tighter, upright, and he's going to kind of take a, a fast step, but it's not you're not beating people on your first step. So it's hard to do that. And then now you're still trying to run up field a lot with these moves that are close to the body. But it's like, you know, I always tell my guys, like, if you get to a certain point as an offensive tackle and they want to go by you upfield, say thank you. Because yeah. you're not you're not going to make the play unless the quarterback exits out the other side. So with Rashawn, you'd love to see you'd love to see him maybe change the way that he gets into his initial stance, more of a hip hinge, maybe a little bit more of a stagger, and allow him to take an explosive first step. One, so you can attack the running game, which he does such a good job of, but really two, so you can challenge leverage on step one. And you know, pass rush and pass pro are just about about getting to a place under control in rhythm. And if you can disrupt the rhythm of the tackle, you've got a real chance. If you can't, it's a really, really hard game to play. And I would say that Rashawn Gary wins more post-confrontation than almost anybody in the National Football League. Like I think he I think most guys are winning before confrontation. I think he is forcing himself to win kind of post what I would call post-confrontation, post-confrontation, yeah. because he's not putting those guys in a bad situation more often than not. Yeah, it's an interesting one. I, I wonder if he would be better in like a three-point stance or something. It's not like he ever drops in coverage. I can't remember the last time I saw him drop in coverage. So just put him in the best position to rush the passer. I'm wondering if they might be able to, to tweak some of that stuff in the offseason. But um, I'm hoping he has a big week this week. I think he's going to have an opportunity against Terrence Steele, but we'll talk about yeah. that as well. Uh, let's talk about uh, here, the hit uh, from Darnell Savage on Cole Komet. I know that was one that uh, you had tweeted out about uh, from a, a two-hand touch standpoint, uh, yeah, but it's just kind of an interesting play. Well, uh, it's Roger Goodell probably was, you know stood up and started cheering when he saw that. It, it was the f- football is a violent sport. That's you know old heads. That's the reason. That's one of the reasons we like the sport. That's the reason that people yell on the sidelines. That's the reason that you know parents. Parents are screaming at their kids because we know that it's inherently violent and bad things can happen. So taking that out of the sport, it kind of changes the dynamics. Darnell Savage has an opportunity to legally knock their best tight end out of the game, at least for a play. I mean, at least do something. And Make he, him feel it, it. It felt like he it, when you watch it on the on the end zone copy, it looks like he just plays two hand touch with him, and he almost realizes it immediately that. There's no way. First of all, great play by Justin Fields, but he just threw what you call a hospital ball, right? And he doesn't have to go to the hospital. I don't. I, if it was me, if I'm the secondary coach, I'd say, listen, we're paying the fine, man. He needs he needs to not be in the game anymore. Justin Fields needs to pay the price for throwing that ball in an NFL game. Yeah, you'd like to see Darnell play with a little bit more physicality in that situation. Like you said, it seemed like he almost realized it after the fact. Um, hopefully it was just one of those bang bang plays and he's a little bit more intimidating moving forward, but that's kind of the Darnell Savage we've seen over five seasons so far. You know, I'm, he's a very interesting name in this off season. I don't, yeah. I think Green Bay goes in a different direction, but I agree. that'll be, a, that'll be an interesting one. All right, let's move over to the offensive side of the ball. Um, uh, obviously everyone's been going, you know, um, rightfully so, uh, bananas over Jordan Love's week this week and what he's been doing over the second half of the season. Uh, he most importantly wins a Nickelodeon Valuable Player Award. Uh, he also gets the FedEx Air and Ground Player and the uh, NFC Player of the Week for the second consecutive week. Um, but he he's obviously been playing with a ton more confidence. Um, just, you know, without probably needing to go too long on it, your thoughts on Jordan this week and uh, his overall performance? I just, it's it's Jordan, but it's, it's really, it's Aaron Jones, who's got another, you know, 100-plus yard rushing rushing game. Uh, Jaden Reed's got 112 yards. Bo Melton, who I – honestly, I, I don't even know who he was a month ago. I mean, I didn't know who he was. I, it, yeah. the, guy's, uh, the guy's an absolute stud. I mean, he's fun to watch. He's he's kind of arrogant. He's he's very, very confident in himself. They'll put him in the single and three-by-one and, and throw to him. He has 62 yards last week. Dontavian Wicks has two touchdowns last week. I mean, these guys can just – it goes back to, is there a better room? Is there a better young wide receiver room in the National Football League? It's just amazing. Yeah. And and Jordan Love, listen, I'll, I'll say it till the cows come home. 
he gets away with a lot of stuff. Um, he does so many things really well. He's so, he's so improved. He's, I mean, Matt LaFleur, the quarterbacks, Comp Clements, they deserve so much credit. And, and Jordan Love deserves so much credit because they the time they must have put in to get him over the hump. Because, like, week seven, man, everyone was going, well, this was a mistake. And he looks – He's making a lot of plays that could go the other way. And you know, we highlight them sometimes on the show. Like it, it's the, the margin for error is razor thin. There's yeah. a pick where it should have been a pick. There's the fumble that could have. I mean, there's things where you, you you blink your eyes and this could be a totally different ball game. But guys got to make plays. They didn't make them the bear on the bear side when they needed to. And he is finding ways to pros to get to a place pre-snap where like post snap for him, it's the game is really, really slow right now. It's really, really slow. You can tell, like, he knows where he's going almost immediately, and he's just waiting on it. And that part of the game is really, really fun. Like, that's true mastery of the sport at the, at the quarterback level. When it's almost like you're just waiting in slow motion for that guy to come open because you know already what the defense is doing. It's like, do you ever remember the Peyton Manning game where I forgot who he was playing, but he threw a pick to somebody. And they're I'm talking about it in the post-game press conference. And they're like, why did you, how did you throw that pick? And he's like, that guy's not supposed to be there. And the place was the place like thought he was being real arrogant. He goes, No, I watch every snap they've ever had. He's not supposed to be there. So they go and ask the guy. He's like, Yeah, I screwed up. I screwed up. <laughs> you know what I mean? So it's like, it's like that level of mastery is what guys like that's what players go, oh my God. Like he's it, it, he's getting it. He's getting he's he's figuring it out. Like it's it's his process is becoming real and the and the and the fruits of his labor are, are becoming, you know, very, very bountiful for the Green Bay Packers. It's awesome. Yeah, I was hoping I was going to get a better answer from him this week. I asked him in the post-game press conference when he felt the game started to slow down for him because it clearly has at some point the season. He just kind of said a generic, like, it's you know it's been getting better every week and just yeah. practice and whatever. Just a generic answer, but um, not totally unexpected. But yeah, it, it definitely has been slowing down for him over the second course of the season. And to your point, uh, and, and as, as I've been talking about this week, the offensive line's gotten better through the second half of the season. The running backs have gotten better. The wide receivers have gotten better. The tight ends have gotten better. It's everyone in unison. And I think Matt deserves a ton of credit too uh, for just the offense that he's calling. It, feel, it really feels like he found a sweet spot with all these players on the team to put them in the right positions that they need to be successful. And we're seeing a much more cohesive offense in the second half, really since that Steelers game. Yeah. Yeah. Aaron, I was going to say Aaron, Aaron Jones. It's Aaron, Aaron Jones. The, and the and the motion pre snap have completely turned around how defenses think about this team. Yep, totally agreed. Uh, we we mostly went over the the impressions of the young wide receivers and the young tight ends in this offense. You mentioned uh, might be the the best young wide receiver core in the NFL. I've been super impressed by Bo Melton. I don't think that this is just a, a two or three week thing. I think he's shown that he can he can play. And I don't know how they're going to divvy up snaps moving forward, but. They seemingly have a, a, almost an embarrassment of riches at wide receiver and tight end right now with these young players. Yeah, and yeah, you start. It's interesting because you start thinking about well, what what can you actually do? I mean, how many? You're in such a great spot right now because there's no ego. Yeah, there's nobody in there. It's like, well, I got to get my ten, and eventually you will get that guy. I mean, eventually it could. And it looks like right now it could be Jaden Reed, it could be Dontavian Wicks. So like we thought it was going to be Dobbs or Watson. It's probably going to be right. one of those two, but. It's going to be one of those guys next year or the year after, and then you're going to have to start going, all right, well, this guy's got to go. we got to switch out, you know, blah, blah, blah. But right now, in this moment, and then going into next season, you probably are six deep at the wide receiver position. You're definitely two deep at the tight end position. And yep. you just all of a sudden have options where, especially with a guy like Jaden Reed, where like you can – if you wanted to turn this completely into the Shanahan offense and make him Debo Samuel – Guys aren't going to bat an eye. Like he's not that phys as physical a guy, yeah. but just from a skill set standpoint, you can run all the same stuff with Aaron Jones, and you can run all the same stuff with with Jaden Reed. So it, it gives you opportunities that just, quite frankly, teams aren't going to have unless they have that kind of group at the wide receiver room. Yeah, a variety of different personnel options, personnel packages, players that can play different roles within those personnel packages. It just gives Matt infinite amount of possibilities. I don't know why I didn't ask you about this sooner. You feel like almost the exact perfect person to ask about this. There's a lot of angst and frustration in Packer land about Christian Watson and his hamstring injuries. Mm -hmm. I think this is the third or fourth iteration of hamstring injuries over the past two seasons. 
He's missed a third of the game so far. It feels like more than that, but it's a third of the games so far that he's missed. Uh, he has practiced so far uh, both days this week. We don't know if he's going to play this weekend yet. That is TBD. But how does this happen? I know Christian mentioned that he's already put thousands of dollars into ensuring that this does not uh, happen moving forward. The Packers have, and Matt has mentioned they're going to do everything in their power this offseason to figure out how this does not happen again. How, how does this happen and how can Christian go about preventing this moving forward? Well, I, it happens because he's a, a tightly wound super athlete and tightly wound super athletes can pull things. Um, you know, can you help make your, I mean, there's this pliability thing. There's all, there's all kinds of different answers, but you, I mean, you really have to get down to how is his pelvis rotated? How does that affect the length of his hamstring when he, you know, when he, puts his knee up over his up. There's a lot of things that kind of go into it from that standpoint. And then there's obviously like the, the actual muscle fiber itself and how pliable and how, how nutrient dense and how um, volumous with water it is, right? There's all of that kind of stuff. But I think the bottom line here is you have to, for me, you have to always look at how does your volume changing from one segment of your life to another? So how hard are you working in the off season? How hard are you? And I'm not saying this is not uh, a, a a suggestion that he doesn't work his ass off because I have no idea. Right. But you always have to look at: Are you able to repeat sprint if you're a wide receiver? How many times can you repeat sprint before you're tired? How many times can you repeat repeat sprint and then show up the next day? And that that becomes kind of your baseline, right? In other words, you're not doing this chronic overtraining all the time. And you know, they, the 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 sports science guys have all these GPS and they're doing all this measuring and stuff. But what they fail to do more often than not is understand the actual positional requirements for Christian Watson understand exactly what he is doing throughout the course of the year to get there, to get that baseline when he shows up at training camp, and then make sure that even if you want to run the same route 16 times in a row because you just want to run it, that you find another way. Or like we like problems that are in other places, if guys are tapping out after they run a go route and they're tapping out and going to the sideline and replacing, no, man, come back. Like Keyshawn Johnson always says, right? Like, man, I didn't miss a rep. Like yeah. the old school guys didn't miss a rep and they didn't get hurt. There's something to be said for these guys are better athletes or more finely tuned or whatever. But the other part of it is like, let's be honest, they don't build up the base that they used to build up by playing every rep all the time, jogging back to the huddle, just doing it again. Like they don't do that anymore. So when I see these injuries, my thought automatically goes to foundationally, are you doing the right thing for yourself? Or are you guys trying to guard this or, or prevent it so much with volume? And then because of that, when he actually has to open up, are you, are you having problems? So immediately a lot of people want to jump to, especially when they see, you know, multiple soft tissue injuries for the Packers this season, it's a strength and conditioning team, or it's something within the organization that's going wrong. It's one now, of the best in the business in Green Bay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah exactly. Uh, and, and now Matt has said that they want to take a full deep dive into everything and try to figure out why these are happening and, and try to, you know, see if there's anything that they can do to improve moving forward, which of course I'm sure they would love to do that. But, um, I don't even know how to respond to that. I don't even know how I asked the question. Like, yeah, I'll let you take it over. Well, from a strength and conditioning standpoint, like I know those guys very well. I played with one of them. The other one was was our SNC coach. I've been when I when I say I've been all over the country and I've met not everybody, but I've met dozens and dozens and dozens of professional, highly elite level guys, and they are as good as those two are as good as anybody you're going to find in an NFL building. You, but you, what you have to recognize is the way of the NFL now, we talked about it offline, the brand, the individualism, those aren't the only guys that are talking to them. I'll give you a story just so you – Clay Matthews. Remember Clay, of course, right? Yeah. Okay. Clay used to go and train with uh, uh, the, the Jay. He used to train with Glazer. He'd go to Unbreakable and he'd go trade, kick a bag 100 times a day, okay? When the, the offseason that, that Clay – was kicking that bag, he started having hamstring injuries. These things aren't a coincidence, right? You, you see what I mean? And, and the, yeah. point, the point of that is that's not what the head strength coach necessarily wanted for him. That's, but that's what, you know, that's what he felt he had to do to get his body ready. So there's a lot of other things 
that like Jay, I, Jay Glazer is amazing. I love his gym. And they, what they do is, is really good for, I'm sure it was really good for Clay in a, in a number of ways. But if you're kicking a bag a bunch of times and that kind of stress that puts that you're not used to, well, it could have an uh, could have a negative effect on your ability, you know, your hamstring ability when you're starting to change direction, and doing some different things from a football dynamic perspective. And I'm not again, I can't say definitively that's the case, but I can say that makes sense to me, right? So you yeah. just have to understand there's a lot of things that go on behind the scenes or outside of the building that these players are welcome and happy to do. And I did it, I did the same thing. But you also have to be able to take accountability for, okay, I hurt my, I. I missed six weeks of training camp and uh, into the no, sorry, I missed six weeks, including three weeks of training camp until the third preseason game, my last year in Green Bay. Why? Because I was doing strongman training. I picked up a three hundred and fifty pound stone and my knee got jacked, and I had a bone bruise on my on my femur, so I couldn't walk. And you know, Mike Sherman was like, "You were doing what?" You know, and I go, "Well, this is how I, I mean, this is how I get ready, man. What do you want me to do?" And you know, he was he was as cool about it as he could be. But right. the truth is, like, he could be very – he could be, he, he could have been like, well, is that football related? And then we'd have to get in that all argument if he was if he was that kind of guy, which he wasn't, thank God. But these guys go out and do this different stuff. And, listen, this the NFL strength conditioning guys, in particular, uh, Giz and, and Mark, like, if, if people are barking up that tree, man, you are on the wrong – go find another playground. I am with you. Uh, well, well said, and I'm so glad I asked, and I don't know why it took me so long to ask that question. Um, all right, really, really quick one. I, I, I recall a couple of years ago when we were talking about Matt and, you know, kind of his, his coaching development. One of the things that you pointed out that was not getting better over and over was special teams. I'm almost positive we talked about that yeah, in 2021. Times. And then what happened at the end of 2021, they lose a game in large part due to their special teams. This special teams has still not been very good over the course of the last couple of seasons with Rich Passaccia coming in. Part of that is a rookie kicker, uh, first-time punter, but it's a lot of other things it feels like as well. We don't need to deep dive too much into it, but yeah. is this just a is this just an issue that is like for gonna be forever in Green Bay? Or like how can they not field a competent special teams in like two decades? It's time. It's 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 time and like focus and effort spent on special teams. Um like so when I when I think of special teams. I, I take the kickers out of the equation because they literally are doing that all day, every day. And if you have a good one, you, you're gonna look, those numbers are going to look good. If you have a bad one, they're not. So yep. you really got to look at coverage and return. So opportunities for return, what does that look like from a blocking standpoint? Again, because otherwise you're just you're basing your whole 11 people on one player. And then from a coverage standpoint, if you're assuming they're kicking the ball where they want to kick it and blah, 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 blah. That is turns into like a 10 or 11 man game. So you can, I think that's the best way to judge if you guys are buying into what's going on. Um, if, if you see a special teams group that isn't performing, my first thought is always, we talked about this last season, is are you using starting linebackers, nickel corner? Are you using those guys? Like the, the guys that are your dudes, are they using them in important moments? If the answer is no, which they weren't doing before Basaccia, I don't remember, I don't know how much they are doing it now, but they weren't doing it at all before back then, then you should get fired because you're not performing and you're not using the best guys unless your head coach isn't allowing you, right? So then the next thing is how much time is the head coach allotting that, that person in practice? And what's, and here's the hard part, Andy, what speed are they allowed to play at? Like, do you think about a, a special teams practice? Okay. So, we go through offensive, defense, individual, group period, team stuff, tweet, tweet, everybody else get water, punt team, you're on full speed. Not, not really a realistic way to do business if you're thinking about the guys that were just on scout team are now having to sprint down six times in a row. You think you're going to get six good reps by the end of practice if that's the fourth thing they did? It's really, really hard, right? So having a plan to make sure those guys are getting what they needed from a high-speed standpoint, decels. Uh, you know, we're talking about breaking down, identifying the ball, changing direction. All of that goes into um, the mindset of becoming a really elite group. And I, I don't know because I'm not there, but those are the – when I've been on teams that haven't had good teams versus, or t good special teams versus had, those two factors are kind of what you look at first. As far as starters playing on special teams, here are the, the top 20 players that have uh, in, in regards to special team snaps so far. These are the players who have played 100 or more special team snaps in order of most to least. Mm -hmm. Eric Wilson, backup. Jonathan Owens, backup slash starter. 
Josiah Deguara backup, Christian Welch basically just there for special teams, Isaiah McDuffie backup, Keyshawn Nixon starter, Tucker Craft starter now, Kingsley Nibari backup, Dallin Levitt no longer on the team, Anders Carlson, TJ Slayton starter-ish, Matt Orzik is their long snapper, Daniel Whalen's their punter, Zane Anderson backup, Corey Ballantyne backup, Robert Rochelle backup, Patrick Taylor backup, Yash Nyman backup, Carl Brooks rotational, Lucas Van Ness rotational, Carrington Valentine rotational starter, sort, sort of starter. So they have not really played any, and it doesn't, it, like Ben Sims is the next one, um, Royce Newman, Malik Heath. So it's, it's not like they're playing a ton of their their top guys on special teams. Quay would be the most, and he's played 59 snaps, um, you know, so it, 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 that's, it's, and it's hard too. Like what you would, the ideal scenario would be, those guys understand that that's how they're going to, they're going to make the team and they're going to get, they're going to get reps. So they really buy into it and they do the best job they can. Again, it's, it's the, you know, the hard part about that, Andy is like, and you just don't know. And you feel like Versace is a guy that really is passionate about what he does and wants yeah. to be, and wants to do the best job he can. Sometimes if you're not the guy, then the best job you can is the best job you can under the circumstances you're dealt. And you just don't know what that is. But when I when you say those names, for the most part, I'm going to take all the defensive and offensive linemen out of the equation because that's just for very specific things. But yeah, when when you when you talk about coverage and 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 returning, they've got guys on that team that should be good. And so then you know then it's just like if you really wanted to do a breakdown, you start going, okay, well, who's making the mistakes? How many mistakes are they making? Who's got the mental errors? Like again, you just have to start weeding through this stuff. Or is there is the is the scheme too? complex is there too are we asking guys to do too many things based on the look that you get is it is it standardized so they can just run down and go you know with their hair on fire there's so there's there's so many things that go into it that we don't necessarily pay attention to i certainly don't at the special teams level and yep. so it's it's hard to say but i always like if you shine a light on a problem and the light's bright enough you usually take care of the problem in the national football league so if you do have a problem that means you're not to me that just means you're not shining a bright enough light Totally agreed. All right, let's talk Packers, Cowboys. Your keys to, uh, and, and matchups to watch in this one. Oh, there's th this is a so they're seven and a half a point dogs. It, but you all like the first thing is you go, okay, well, they're seven and a half point dogs. They really should. I mean, three years ago, they're not even in the playoffs, and the Dallas Cowboys have a bye. So, right there, and then you go, the Dallas Cowboys haven't been good in the playoffs for 30 years. That's all they talk about. Jerry Jones can't stop talking about it. Mike McCarthy will never feel. Um, not appreciated, but valued in that place unless he drops a banner. And now they're playing a seventh seed that he used to play against is the place he knows he's known about the most. This offense can score against the, the Cowboys defense. Yep. And he's got Jerry Jones in his ear all the time. And I'm going, this actually kind of feels like ripe for an upset. For no, like, take everything else off the field, just like Cowboys history. Now we're talking about like actual field stuff. There's a bunch going on here, but number one, Aaron Jones has to get 20 touches. This, least, this Cowboys yeah. defense plays a middle uh, will linebacker that's 205 pounds. They'll run six in the box, and they'll play 10 yards off in coverage. If you don't take the underneath stuff, the screen game, uh, shallow crossers, and run the football when there's six in the box, you deserve to lose against this team. Because Dan Quinn is just going to play that single high. He'll play man and match. He'll play a couple of zone things. But it, like he's not trying to fool you. He's going to tell you what he's doing. This isn't, this isn't going to be a smoke and mirrors thing. He thinks that their pass rush is better than what you've got. And he thinks that their coverage guys are going to sit back and jump on routes because their pass rush is better than what you got to protect. So it's just a question of how do you expose them? Expose them with a play action pass. You expose them with taking the easy, the, the, the gimmies, and you've got to be able to run the football when they put a 205 pound linebacker in the game. It's to me, it's like really that easy on offense. And then defensively is like, there's going to be body blows in this game early. The Dallas Cowboys are going to think we're going to run down the field. We're going to CD Lamb's going to have a five yard out for the first touchdown. You know, uh, you know, Gallup's going to have a, a, a deep crosser for the second. It's going to be 14 nothing, and we're going to let our dogs loose on defense. And I think that, you know, it's imperative that the Packers hold these guys to field goals early in the game and just get this offense a chance to feel like we can run our stuff and we're not down 14 17 early. I think if you do that, you got a real chance to win it. If not, it's like, I, Andy, I couldn't. You could barely watch the Commanders game. They're so bad on defense now because they got rid of all you know Montez Sweat and and and, and yep. Chase. They're so bad, and it just looks like they had no belief. They're waiting for vacation, but then you go to the offensive side where they're trying to do something. They just don't have it. They don't have enough talent, and they gave up like at the end of the game because they're down thirty five seventeen or whatever. Like they gave up five sacks in a row, or like five out of seven. It was some. I don't know what the real number was, but it felt like 
every single snap was a sack. And it was like, this is where they're getting all their numbers. They get to a point where you don't have a choice. And I mean, if I go down, like they've, it's not just Demarcus Lawrence. It's not just Micah Parsons. Like Sam Williams can ball. Dante Fowler Jr. can ball. Dorrance Armstrong can ball. Like those, if they want to pass rush, they can pass rush. They got guys as many as you want to bring in. So you really have to do a good job early. Just body blows, body blows, body blows. Offense has to feel supremely confident. I, in my opinion, they can move the ball in this defense, though, and that's going to have to ride it out. Yeah, Sam Williams had a, a sack against Elton Jenkins last year. Uh, I went back and rewatched that game last night. He had a nice sack against Elton last year. So, yeah, it's, it's more than just those top two guys. Um, the, the two things that I felt that, that buoyed me a little bit after watching that game, Green Bay started with seven consecutive runs to start that game last year. <clears throat> Excuse me, last year. Um, so it, it felt like Matt knew – all right, and it's a totally different team. I went back and I looked at the players that were uh, playing in that game. Um, out of the 45 players that played in this game, depending on the injuries of, of like Watson and, and uh, J- uh, Jair and Deguara and, and a couple of guys like that, or sorry, um, Dylan, yeah. uh, like there could be a, like 18 or 19 guys that play in this game this week that were, were playing in the game last, just a year ago, which is crazy. But um, I was buoyed by the fact that they ran the ball the first seven times. And I also love the fact that they were down by 14 in the second half um, against that Cowboys team. And they came back, tied it up, and then went down and won the game in overtime. So it was not a perfect game by any means. There's a couple of plays in that game where if they go slightly different, Dallas probably walks away with that one. But uh, there were definitely some positive takeaways from that rewatch. Yeah, certainly. And, and I, I would say this, like – I. You'd love to see them try to establish a run early, whether it needs to be seven or not. But the more, like the more important thing for me is in the third quarter, you have to run the ball as well. And, yep. and you have to be able to get in pot. And the thing is, like, you have been able to do that for the last at least three games with Aaron Jones. So I, I, when you watch – this is a Cowboys defense that they, they are – they're a good defense. I think they're like 16th against the run. And when you watch them, you go, well, a lot of this stuff is like – opportunistic their offense is the number one offense in the national football league they put people in bad positions and so you get into these spots where they can sit and they can jump routes they can they can rush the passer they can you know how are you gonna are you gonna make sure that micah parsons is accounted for they're gonna play four down they'll they'll stand micah parsons up against the center and they'll bring it they'll bring a a safety into the box and he'll be the other guy like they run six in the box but they really got five d linemen how do you want to deal with like all that communication stuff is important but you have to be on second and third down it's got to be manageable I think yeah. that's the big thing. And, and if you can do that through the running game, through the short passing game with Jaden Reed, you know, wow. by hook or crook, you know, Andy Reed used to not run the football at all when he was with Philly. He used to, he used to throw slants, his slants for the pass, his hitch and slants for passing game. And, and you just, I don't think that works with this, uh, this offense because of, because of the difference between Aaron Jones and kind of everybody else from an experience and production standpoint, but you have to get into situations where you just feel really good about your play sheet on you know second and manageable third and manageable if you do that again i just i don't see where i just don't see where this this skill position group and i would never have said this three months ago but i just don't see where the skill position group looks at the dallas defense and goes they're really nervous like i feel they should walk in there like you know their chest their chest out as big as they can make them and they should feel really good about the ability to move the football Totally agreed. Seven and a half still seems very large to me, and I really like Green Bay's chances to compete in this one. I think there could be an upset. We'll see. Uh, last but not least, we got to get you out of here, but quick thoughts on the coaching carousel and some of the big coaching changes. I mean, in a 24-hour period, I know it's college too, but Nick Saban, Bill Belichick, Pete Carroll, and then a little bit before that, Mike Vrabel, all going out in a short period of time. Just a, a crazy coaching cycle so far. Yeah, it's it, it's – so, I mean, I, when I've been growing up since I was 20 years old, the best coaches in the world for me were, were, were Pete and, 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 well, Bill, number one, and Pete, number two. Uh, and, and Nick Saban at the college level has always been super impressive. Mike Vrabel is, it, to me, Mike Vrabel is a, is a top three coach in the National Football League. I think to players now, just, you know, having relationships with players and understanding what, what goes on in that building, he's a top – top three coach in the national football from a culture standpoint, he's a top guy. And, and what, what Baff, it just shows you like the incompetence of, of, of some of these owners. Um, I don't understand. There's a lot of people that go out and say, Hey, we want to go get the, you know, this, this crazy good play caller and this and that. And that's fine. That's great. But like play calling Sean McVay is, is a genius, but Sean McVay is not like, he's not who he is just because he can call offenses. Well like said. he's got people buying into what he's selling. 
Kyle Shannon has people buy. So people look at that and they go, yeah, we need one of those guys. Like those guys are unicorns. Just because you can call like those are, that's two totally different things. What you need is a guy who develops, like, is there anybody in the national football league over the last 30 years, 50, pick a number that more people love when leaving the program than Pete Carroll. I mean, dude, it's like, it's like Dan Campbell, right? So Dan's up in Detroit. Dan doesn't call plays. That team would do any, that team would sell their children for him. You know what I mean? I mean, they would yeah. do anything for him. And like, I don't under, I don't know that, play, that, that like fans or out people outside owners understand how valuable that is. He might very well lose both his coordinators this year. He might lose Ben and Aaron, and they're both deserving. Yeah. And I hope they both get – I bet I worked with Ben. Ben's one of the greatest guys in the world, man. I hope he gets a head coaching job. I know he's going to if he wants it. He's a great guy. But neither of those guys are Dan yeah. from that point of view. And so, like, I just don't know that – I just don't know that that part is valued when, to me, that's the most valuable thing you can have. It's, it's, it's interesting. Totally, totally, totally agree. I, the Vrabel one was was surprising for for that that main reason. I was I I don't know what to make of Matt Eberflus one way or the other. I, I, I we just haven't seen the, the team around him. But there's a lot of really good coaches out there now, and I'm just kind of more that's, happy that's than anything. Side, sideline, just okay, just from sideline. Listen, I don't know him at all. I don't. I know one guy in the building. I never talk about the head coach. Just from sideline demeanor, it makes me pause. Yep. Just from sideline demeanor, it makes me pause. But good for them. You know, here's the thing that doesn't make sense about Eberflus. If you fire your offensive staff, what does that say about Justin Fields? Because you're not going to get a crackerjack OC to come in there with a guy who's probably on a short leash. On a lame duck, yeah. It don't make any sense because it because like if Justin Fields has one year to prove himself, he's either the guy or he's not. If I don't think he is. But if they're going to go not. draft, Kate, if they're going to go draft, Kate, you don't think he is there, right? I, I'm, a, I would be beyond shocked. I would put so much on it that Justin Fields is not back. Okay, that, so, they're, so they're going to pick up Caleb, right? Yeah, or Drake, maybe, so. probably Caleb, right? So you're going to pick up Caleb Williams, and you're the owner of the, the Chicago Bears. You run the, you run the place, or you're Ryan Poles. You're going to pick up Caleb Williams, and you're going to go. Here's a defensive coach whose defense isn't any good, and has struggled to win games. And has has so far hired two coordinators have shown the an inability to develop quarterbacks. And you think Caleb Williams, after everything Caleb Williams already said about like I'm not going to certain places, you think he's showing up? Yeah, I don't know. It's going to be a very interesting off season in Chicago. Um, we could probably do a whole nother episode on that. Mike, I don't know. Like, I feel every time when we get done with 45 minutes of talking, I could probably go for another hour and 45 minutes. Uh, these are fun every single week. I appreciate you a ton. Uh, tell everyone about the podcast and where we can find all your amazing work. Yeah. The on my block previews out right now for this Packers Dallas game. I think it's going to be a fun one, Andy. You can find me at Mike wall 68, uh, on X uh, process to perform on Instagram. Hit me up on the uh, process to perform channel on YouTube. Like and subscribe for that. Thanks again for having me on. Always fun. Always fun, Mike. Go follow all of his stuff. It's tremendous. You can find me at Andy Herman NFL. You can follow the podcast at Pack-A-Day Podcast. That's going to do it for us today. But until next time, and as always, go Pack Go.